So Jesus and his disciples, plus lots of other people from all over Israel, headed to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Many of them had heard about Jesus, and when he entered Jerusalem, a huge crowd came out, laying down their coats and palm branches, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! That's like what we do in church right before Easter. It is, Ian. We remember that event every year on Palm Sunday. It sounds like the crowd knows Jesus is the Messiah, but it also sounds like they think he's going to be a king just like King David. I'm not sure they understand about this new kind of kingdom. No, they don't. Of course, this kind of scene is really going to attract the attention of the Romans. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees know they have to do something about Jesus and quick. So Jesus and his disciples gather for the Passover meal, just like all the Jews did every year. But Jesus does something very different that no one expects. First, he says one of his 12 disciples is going to betray him, help the Sadducees and Pharisees grab him and take him away. This freaks everybody out. Then Jesus picks up a piece of the bread they were eating and says, this is my body which is given for you. Then he picks up the cup they were drinking from and says, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Wait, what's going on? Was Jesus saying that, that he was the Passover lamb? He was the one who would die so that we could live? That's exactly what he was saying. Jesus took the Passover meal, where Israelites celebrated being saved from death and from slavery by the blood of a lamb, and said he was that lamb, that his blood could take away sin and death from everyone, the blessing for the whole world, the new covenant God was making with his children. <gasps> new covenant? That's what New Testament means! <gasps> This is what the whole New Testament is about. The blood of Jesus is the new covenant. The whole Bible points to this moment, from Genesis when we learn how creation was broken by sin, to Abraham, Moses, and David, to the prophets who say the answer is coming, the Savior is coming, the Messiah is coming. The entire Bible is about this. But the story isn't over yet. Jesus goes to a garden to pray. He knows what he has to do now, and it isn't going to be easy. After he prays, he turns to his friends and says, the hour has come. And right then, his disciple Judas shows up, leading a crowd of guards to arrest Jesus. They put Jesus on trial, first at the Jewish court called the Sanhedrin, run by the Sadducees and Pharisees. His crime? Blasphemy saying he was equal to God. His punishment? Death. But the Romans don't let the Sanhedrin put anyone to death themselves, so the members of the court drag Jesus to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And even though Pilate doesn't think Jesus has done anything wrong, he doesn't want the Sadducees and Pharisees to complain about him to Rome like they've done with other governors before him. So he gives in. He washes his hands in front of everyone, a way of saying, this isn't my fault. And he has Jesus killed, crucified, by nailing him to a wooden cross. As Jesus is dying, he looks up to heaven and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Suddenly the sky grows dark and Jesus dies. The curtain in the temple rips from top to bottom. The Roman guard standing closest to Jesus sees all this and says, surely this man was the son of God. Well, of course he was. Haven't they been paying any attention? But now he's dead, the son of God. They killed him. How can he bless the whole world if he's dead? This isn't very good news at all. Now, wait a minute. During his life, Jesus did a couple of really important things. First, he showed us who God was. Jesus said to see me is to see the Father. God the Son shows us what God the Father is like. He's incredibly loving, incredibly good, incredibly powerful. The life of Jesus tells us a lot about who God is. That's true. That's something good that he did. 
What else did Jesus do while he was alive? He announced the kingdom of God and showed us what it would be like. Oh yeah, the kingdom of God. What is that exactly? Before Adam and Eve sinned, God reigned on earth, and Adam and Eve reigned with him as children of the king. They were never hungry, they were never sick, they never had to worry about death because they lived in God's kingdom, creation the way it was supposed to be. But sin ruined that. So Jesus shows up and announces that the kingdom of God is back. Then he gives everyone a taste of what that kingdom is like through his miracles. There will be no hunger. Bam, he feeds 5,000 people just like that. There will be no sickness. Boom, he heals people, the crippled, the blind. Whatever is broken about us is fixed the way it was supposed to be. He calms the wild sea and even raises people from the dead to show that in this kingdom of God, there is nothing to fear not even death itself. But what about sin? Our sin means we can't be with God. How can we reign with him if we can't be with him? Oh, good question. What about that? What about sin? This is the most amazing part. The people around Jesus just saw a man dying on a cross, but that's not what God saw. God saw something very different happening. God saw his son, the son of God, on a cross. Then he saw the stain of our sin appearing on Jesus. Your sin, my sin, everything selfish and mean we've ever done or ever could do. The stain of all that sin was appearing on Jesus, even though he'd never done anything wrong at all. God saw his son stained with all the sin of the world. He saw him buried under all that sin. He saw him die under all that sin. And since the punishment for all that sin is death, death away from God, that's how Jesus died, alone, away from God. The last thing Jesus said was, God, God, why have you left me alone? But if he died, how can we say Jesus has power over death? Because he didn't stay dead. Jesus was crucified on a Friday and placed in a tomb that night. On Sunday morning, two women who were followers of Jesus went to the tomb and discovered something incredible. It was empty. The huge stone that blocked the entrance had been rolled away and Jesus wasn't there. Matthew and Luke both tell us that the women meet an angel who says Jesus is no longer dead. He's alive. This is what we celebrate on Easter Sunday. This is what we celebrate every Sunday, but especially on Easter Sunday. They didn't have to take the angel's word for it though, because Jesus appears right in front of them, living, walking around and talking. And then Jesus appears to his disciples, and then to more than 500 people. Jesus proved that he had authority over death itself, that the power of sin and death was broken, that the kingdom of God was real, and that we can all be a part of it. Wow, that's not just good news, that's amazing news. So is this it? Is that how it ends? Jesus tells his disciples to go tell everyone, spread the blessing to the whole world so everyone can hear, so everyone has a chance to be a part of the new kingdom. And then, according to Luke, Jesus blesses his disciples and disappears into the clouds. Wowzers! So, those are the Gospels, the good news, the amazing news. We're all invited to be a part of the kingdom of God, to be sons and daughters of the King. And Jesus is a Lamb of God who saves us. Saves us from what? From the stain of sin that keeps us away from God. From the power of sin that ruins our lives and our relationships. And eventually, even from the presence of sin, when the kingdom of God explodes in full bloom, wiping out sin and sickness and death forever. When will this happen? How does this work? Does God make us be a part of his kingdom? Good questions, Ian. So when will God wipe out sin and sickness and evil and death forever? We don't know, because he hasn't told us. 
As for your other question, Jesus doesn't make us follow him. He invites us to follow him, to be a part of the new kingdom, to experience life as a child of the king. But like any invitation, we can say, no thanks, not interested. Why wouldn't you want to be a child of the king? Yeah. Why would anyone say no to that? As we go through the rest of the New Testament, we'll talk about that too. So as you're watching and learning, if you realize that you've never decided to follow Jesus, that you've never said, hey, I want to be a part of the kingdom of God, but you think you want to, talk to your parents or your Sunday school teacher or your pastor. If you're a grown-up, talk to another grown-up that you know follows Jesus. And keep watching because we've got a whole lot more to learn.